There we go. Hey, man. Oh my gosh. Hey. <laughs> Good. It's so funny. I have the same thing in my garage, too. This is exactly the response we were going for. Oh my yeah. gosh. You nailed it. You nailed it. The, oh my gosh. Oh, this is, this is I, in my home? <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I love it. It's like, I, I mean, there's so many photos of you. Which is all I could ever ask that's for. That's the focus. Yeah, yeah. funny, but yeah. seriously, I have the same thing in uh, my house. That's what I heard. Everyone's yeah. like, you, you and Connor have to meet because he's got a shrine to you. Uh, I said, who doesn't? Funny. Who <laughs> doesn't? I know, that's great. We have that in common already. So we're, <laughs> off to, we're off to the races. So would you like to come sit at our booth? I would be so honored. Okay, let's do exactly that. <laughs> You always gotta have a little bit of disappointment in there. You know, gotta That's give him a little bit of disappointment. Yeah. That's what I did. I was like, not, I'm gonna choose the most unstable career path that you can think of. <laughs> and then I'm gonna pursue that for the rest of my life so you guys can never fall asleep sound. <laughs> and you are, right? I mean, you're, you're, we were saying this, you, this is half your life. You are making that transition from, you're far from a child now, but from child to adolescent yeah. to adult acting. Yeah, absolutely. I, but I, I, I think what's funny is uh, you spend so much of your 20s, um, as I'm making this transition out of like being a child actor, uh, I'm just making a transition to being a teen actor. Right. Because there's so many 20 year olds that play teenagers. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny. You, uh, you look at uh, Euphoria, for example, and uh, very talented cast. Sure. But also a lot of them in their mid-20s. Yeah. Uh, playing 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds. It's true. Which is very funny. And that's true. All the way back to 90210 and stuff in the 80s and 90s, it was that way. They yeah. were, a lot of them are mid to later 20s and they're playing in high school and you're going, wow, that is, that's interesting. Yeah. They, they did it back then, they still do it now. Yeah. Sure so that makes the kids feel good about yeah. what, losing those jobs. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, I, I heard in one of your interviews, you said acting is hard. It doesn't come easy to you. It's hard. It's a challenge. Yes. Is that still true? Yeah. I um, I, I think it's always been one of those skills. Um, I'm going to like repeat myself here, but like that doesn't come naturally to me. Um, it's it's one that I've had to like dedicate a lot of time and classes to. And um, I like it that way because uh, I never feel satisfied. And that makes me want to like keep working and keep doing things. Because um, I think the moment that I feel like, oh, I've, I've conquered this skill is, is the moment that my career dies for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as an actor, you, you should never stop learning. Like your, your craft is ever evolving. Sure, sure. And do you, do you feel like you summon that talent at will? You're able to just turn it on? Or is it you feel like if you've prepped and you've prepped and you've prepped and you're ready? Or how do you feel like, okay. Yeah. Go, especially during COVID when you're saying it's hard to... Yeah, it's it, it's it's a mix. I think there's the frustrating thing about acting is it's art at the end of the day. So it's it's it, creativity is going to be there some days and it's it's not other days. Mm -hmm. And I think some days I show up on set and it's it's butter. It's it's great. Everything is moving smoothly and I'm like nailing all of these scenes. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't feel anxious. Um, and then there's other days where you know, they'll just be a back and forth of like, you're, you're going to the director, you're like, this doesn't feel right. And they're like, yeah, I know something isn't working. And you're, it's like a puzzle. You're just trying to figure it out. And those days can be frustrating, but I try to make them, I, I try to readjust it to feel more rewarding because it's, I'm trying to figure it out. Are you ever off or you're going, you know, I, I'm not feeling, but the director's like, no, that's great. Or oh, vice versa, all the, all the time. I, <laughs> I, Which would you rather? Or uh, you don't feel it? Or what? I mean, or you're like, gosh. I think I'm always going to feel that way. I think okay. I'm, I'm always going to feel unsatisfied with my work. Mm -hmm. uh, what, <laughs> my, my friend, um, uh, Julia Hart, who I worked with on Stargirl, uh, she directed it. Mm -hmm. And we, what was really challenging was my, my scenes were like really sporadically, uh, they were sporadic throughout the shoot. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like come in for like a day or two and then I would have like two weeks off. And so like I, I came in one day for uh, the tail end of the day um, and I, it just felt off. I just, I felt like I was having a horrible day. And I went to her and I was just like, Julia, if you need to reshoot this day, like I will come back for free. Oh, like, what, wow. <laughs> like whatever you need to do, like I'm so sorry. And she was like, I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about, but thank you. <laughs> That's unusual isn't it? to offer that up. And I, I mean, I, and your agent was probably going 10% of zero. 10% <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> well, no, that's funny. Like when, when I first started doing stand up, I remember I was doing a gig on the East Coast, and then somebody told me that he drove a hundred miles to come see my show. Wow. And I know my show went really well, but I go, so do you want to like go? Do you guys want to go do something after this? Like yeah. I just blurted it out, and he goes, well, I mean, isn't that that was a show though, right? But I felt so insecure because I go, I'm funny. I'm not like a two hundred mile round trip funny. Yeah. I feel like I need to like take you out for a drink now and make up for oh, that. Oh, hundred percent. So that's normal. Yeah. Or we're equally abnormal. Yeah, or we both just have anxiety disorders. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So you you you've admitted or you you've embraced the fact that you really do. Yeah, no, I I I'm like very open with my um, my journey with yeah. mental illness um, and what that process has been like. And I I guess like what I hoped by sharing it is like mm -hmm. other people feel more comfortable talking about sure. their stuff. I don't know. That's I, that's what's helped me the most is like just being vulnerable about my experiences sure. and going. This is what I struggle with. This is what I go through. And and I hope that another South Asian kid can feel a similar way and maybe have challenging conversations with their family about like, this is what I'm struggling with. Sure. When you have a journey as an actor and then you have a journey as you as a person, is that hard then to grow up in the limelight and have this development? You obviously have a lot of these pressures, your, your childhood to adolescent to adult now. I mean, how do you keep track of that with your own journey with anxiety and things like that? Because I mean, I, yeah. I, I go through some of that stuff too, but not yeah. near, yours is so magnified. Yeah, I think it, it makes it a little bit, it definitely worsens the situation at times, <laughs> I, I have to admit. I mean, give a kid an anxiety disorder and depression and then throw in a full-time job and, and school is not exactly like <laughs> ideal for stability. Um, but at the same time, I was so grateful to be on the set mm -hmm. because I firmly believe I would have been eaten alive in, in, in school. <laughs> like if really? I actually, oh yeah, I would have, I think I would have been the school punching bag. Okay. I would have fully accepted it. Um, but I was so grateful to be around like 200 adults all like mm -hmm. all day long for 10 hours a day, whatever it was. Um, and to be around people that I really loved working with, it felt like a really safe space for me to really discover myself and really understand who I was and um, also just really enjoy, I really enjoy what I'm doing sure. and what I've done. Um, so n none of it felt like bad or, or uh, like a negative experience, but that doesn't take away from the fact that sure, yeah, like at times sure. it, it, it does feel stressful. And I think when it comes to the growing up part of it, your milestones are just a little bit I heard you say that they were kind of like the dating thing may come later, but you've already done whatever. You've already held a full time job. You're already working. Yeah, shifts, exactly. But I haven't <laughs> had my first kits or whatever it was. I'm not I, no, no words in your mouth or tongues in your mouth. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's it's it's actually perfectly put because you're just like, okay, I just worked a twelve hour shift, right. um, but I've never been asked out on a date. Right. <laughs> But it seems like your generation is more open about anxiety, depression. Is that is that a generational thing where your friends and people who are your age talk more about that or more open, or do you still feel like it's stigmatized? I I think I'm exploring in my in um, as I like go through life that it's still pretty stigmatized because in LA we just we live in a little bit of a bubble. It's <laughs> yeah, very much so. It, it's very. It's nice to have like a liberal mecca where mm -hmm. people are so open and understanding and empathetic to other people's experiences, but it's not that way all the time. Um, and I, I'm really grateful for my friends in that process because they were ones who were kind of like, hey, you seem off, like what's going on? And had really important conversations with me and made sure that they were like holding my hand through the process while mm. I was like, you know, going through this journey of, well, why do I feel this way? What is this? Is this chronic? Is this situational? Um, and then also carrying that conversation over to my family. And that can also be a challenging dynamic because as I'm sure you know, uh, mental illness like doesn't exist in India. Like it's not, yeah. it's not a thing. It's G like- Gays only now start to exist. Yeah. <laughs> that was never a thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like the, the, the queer scene is, is just developing in India. The um, just, being independent and being single and like living on your own is. I think that's what America is so 
good or bad, good at being bad at, which is we just discovered, like we just are giving rights to gay, trans, etc. And then we look down on other countries. We're like, well, dude, we just did this. It's like when you yeah. learn a new word and you look down on everyone else, like, oh, you don't know that word. Yeah. The pitch you just didn't yeah. know that five minutes ago. I yeah. just told you that. Exactly. It's it's gonna it's going to take a lot of time and that's and that's unfortunate, but it's really exciting to see that these trailblazers in India right now are having access to resources mm -hmm. like social media and just technology now mm -hmm. that they can better mobilize and better create safe spaces for themselves and, and other people. How do you see yourself? So in other words, I mean, do you... A which douche tra bag. A do <laughs> <laughs> Do you? <laughs> I just, I, 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 I don't know. I've been working, uh, well, let me let you finish it. No, I, I feel like there's a douchey quality to every Indian guy. Yeah, yeah. I think every Indian guy like has this thing where it's like, if you see an Indian guy walking down the street and you're like, douche, yeah. we all, we're all kind of like, I know, uh, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm just little, trying to fit in. <laughs> I'm trying to fit in. I'm trying to do what I got to do here. I'm not sure. No, I mean like, do you think of yourself as a male first, a, an American, a, a Hindu, an Indian, a Punjabi, an actor, whatever, like as you move through the world, is this, yeah. which traits do you feel really define who you are? Um, oh, that's a really good question. I, I think I first identify as a person of color going through the world. Okay. That's, I. So I, you feel camaraderie with other people of color? Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, a majority of my friend group is, is like white people, but like okay. it's... Uh, well, but, it's Disney, right? But, so they, they have diversity, but a yeah. lot, you know, it, it's a fairly, you know, it's a fairly general market. Yeah, market but there's diversity. something, there's, there's just that uh, connection of when you see another person of color in this industry or mm -hmm. you, you meet them, you're just like, wait, like, let's compare notes. How has your journey been through this? Uh, and like, let sure. me tell you about my journey. And I think that's like so exciting. I, I think I've felt the most camaraderie mm -hmm. um, through that identity. What do you see your, as, as your, your role in the South Asian community? Um, to be the disappointment. Uh, <laughs> to be the douchebag. <laughs> that's, douche that's taken. Uh, that's sorry, guys. No, that, that's yeah. Taken. That's like, uh, I, I have, I have no idea other than to just do as much justice as I can by them, hmm. and I try to make it easier for the next generation. Okay. I think every every generation carries their own burden, regardless of like um, what race or what uh, gender, or what sexuality they might be. They carry their own individual burdens, and the goal is to relieve those burdens so you don't pass them on to the next generation. Sure. And I think that's just like my main goal in this process is to make sure that. The, the next generation of South Asian um, youth feel empowered and feel more, uh, feel like they live more in multiplicity rather than being like a single, like, in, like having to fill a single uh, identity of like a doctor or an engineer or whatever it might be. So how do you do that? Who, I, I think it's figuring out who you truly are and embracing that Wow, that first part's really hard in yeah. and of itself. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's way easier said than done, mm -hmm. and I think that's a lifelong process. But it's just constantly embracing who you are unapologetically and understanding that you are in no deficit by being uh, being yourself. I love that. I what you've achieved, not to fanboy, but it's just it's really unreal. I mean, oh, it's really you. unreal. I don't think that phrase goes <laughs> together, but you know what I'm saying. It's just. To, you're the first really breakout, especially child star that we've had, where your life is going to be in the limelight in America like that. I, I don't know. Maybe there is somebody out there, that, but I don't think so, right? Is there someone else like I, that, an analog? The, the only, the, like, uh, the closest that I can I can claim to a, a, a title is I, I think I'm the first South Asian series regular on Disney Channel. I'm pretty I, I'm pretty confident about that. Yes. And when when I got the role, I and we had that conversation with with Disney execs of like, oh, I, this is the first uh, South Asian series regular. Um, so they I, told you that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then I'd say you are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they have the notes. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was it was really surprising. I was like, oh yeah, I guess that hasn't happened yet. Right. Um, and that's also scary at the same time. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, that's. A I don't want to be the last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to screw this up. <laughs> yeah. I'll be another superlative. Yeah. You're, I'm, you're, this is it. I'm going to close the door for yeah. all of us. So that's great. No, I think that that is a thing for sure. Do you did you ever catch hell for the accent? Uh, I I do, um, and I think it's fully warranted. 
I oh, think that's, okay. I think that's fully, like, fully fair. I, I think that when it comes down to the character I played on Disney Channel, on Jesse and then on Bunked. Jesse on Bunked, uh, Ravi, it was. It was a step forward, but not in the perfect direction. And okay. that's how I like to describe it, is I'm proud of the fact that we have South Asian representation and we're furthering that within the channel. And I, I'd like to believe it opened some doors for other people as well. But at the same time, I know that it wasn't, it, it wasn't perfect for everyone. And that's completely fine. And that's completely reasonable because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what is gonna make this industry amazing, is holding it accountable and going, we want better. Sure. And it's completely reasonable for people to look at my work and go, we want better. And I would like to do the best I can to, I don't know, further representation in a positive way and mm -hmm. continue doing that through my work. That's pretty humble of you. Thanks, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, some people will get defensive, but like, well, hey, you know, it's a job, whatever, but it's like, I think there's a recognition of, like you said, it's a step, maybe not in the completely right direction, but is that how you put it? Yeah, okay, it's, okay. exactly. Um, and I don't know, we're all just trying to do the best that we can, and... Well, I don't know um, if everybody is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not give too much credit. Yeah, likes, likes, to be, uh, likes not to be too generous. <laughs> Let's not be that magnanimous. Yeah. I don't think that's true. Um, but, yeah. but, but I'd like but to... But you are. I, well, I'm trying to. Right. And at, at the time, I thought that was like the best thing that I, I could mm -hmm. be doing. Um, and in retrospect, I think there was more to be done that could have been, you know, in a more positive form of representation. Did other actors have accents on the shows? Uh, no, it okay. was it was just me. Why do you think they did that? Um, I, you know what? I I think that was solely because in, in the audition process, it was like, you can do an Indian accent. Right. Can you, can we try it with one? Right, right, right. <laughs> and then it would just stuck from there. Yeah. Um, and... It is funnier. <laughs> well, no, I mean, this is this is what we go through. So if, funnily enough, you know, in stand-up comedy, there's the hacky bit of doing, you know, your parents' accent and whatever. But coming up, I mean, I started a long time ago, whenever I would do my dad's accent, and then I would talk as if my mom said something, I would not put an accent on my mom's words because I still cannot hear my mom's accent when yeah. she speaks. Yeah, same my, with my mom too as well. Is that true for you? Yeah. Really? Same way. So you hear your dad's, but not your mom's. Yeah. But your mom does have an accent. Um, I, I think to other people, they would pick up on her accent. Why is I, that? I, well, it's funny enough, my mom also used to be a teacher. Um, oh, weird. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's like my mom. My, yeah, my, yeah mm -hmm. my mom taught English in India mm. um, and picked it up from there. She also went to like uh, an English-speaking school. Mm -hmm. And then I think over time, she was just able to like wean off of her accent, whereas my dad had to do more like picking picking up the pieces as, as he went. So like. Right. Came to came to America, did not understand the phrase "Hey there," and like some oh had, like that yeah like he uh, he would tell me a story. He was like, I worked at a gas station and someone came up to me and was like, "Hey there," and I was like, "What?" and I was <laughs> and the guy was like, "Hey," and you're there. There yeah right right it's, it's not as, as, as yeah as, as, so my dad really had to like no. piecemeal English together, whereas oh. my mom had a more. Like, but did he he didn't speak English in India? More Punjabi and Hindi? Or? Yeah, he spoke more Punjabi and Hindi, but okay. I, I believe he had like some semblance of a foundation for English, and then like picked it up as he went. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, then that would be the explanation, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone like acting wise whose career you would like to emulate, especially from the child to adult transition? Because there's so few of them. Oh, uh, yeah, there's, I, I think I want to be a mix of Jason Bateman and like Riz Ahmed. Oh, wow. Um, I think, I, I mean, I'm really trying to set a high, really high bar for myself. That's great, right, no. That's, Eight that's, stars. I mean, uh, Jason Bateman, I mean, he just, He's had such a long-standing career, but he's also such a versatile director and an actor, and that's what I really appreciate about him. And I think Riz Ahmed is constantly being able to jump from commercialism to artistry really seamlessly, and, and that's kind of what I, what I want to enjoy. I want to be able to go, hey, I'm gonna spend the summer doing an indie for like SAG scale and make no money, and um, then jump over to like a major, like huge box office, $200 million film franchise, and do both of those seamlessly right while also like saying hey i want to direct something or yeah i want to act in something and, and do that that's a, i mean that's a great answer and jason bateman yeah i grew up on him too because like, who's not the guy from the <laughs> sitcom valerie or whatever it's like yeah that's the same dude i 
been working on that a lot, funny enough, not with my therapist, but with my agent. Um, <laughs> uh, I because um, your agent wants you to do more and more, or uh, your agent wants you to focus. Uh, focus. Okay. Um, it, what's What's really nice is I, I we started working together in um, beginning of the pandemic. It was funny enough. She was like, I would like to. I'd like to join your team, and I was like, "Great, awesome!" And then the pandemic hit, and we were like, "Okay, we can't really do anything yeah, we're yet." Together but now. what's what's been nice is as work has been starting up, she's really helped me um, acknowledge my my self worth and help me go like, "No, you've you've already read for this like three or four times. Mm -hmm. They know what you can do, and we're gonna let them decide now. We're not gonna make you read like." for another five times for them, or whatever it might be, you're going, hey, I don't, like, I think the power is in your, in your court here, and I think you can decide if yes or no, and helping me to, helping me be patient and understand that there will be more opportunities, mm -hmm. it's just, it's worth saying no to wait for the right one. Wow, that is good. And that's your agent, not your therapist. Yeah, yeah, that's my <laughs> agent, not my therapist. <laughs> Funny enough, I should put her on payroll as therapist as yeah, well. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, just, uh, that's now been documented. So yeah. yeah that's, totally, that's totally understandable. Because I think that is, that is pretty cool, that um, it, it's, it's a hard thing to figure out when to say no, because we all, especially yeah. if you have anxiety, you're like, oh, does that person hate me now? And Yeah, but it's such a powerful thing. It's, su yes. it's, it's important and it's a powerful thing to learn. Um, and I think as people of color, but also, um, South Asians, we're constantly taught to keep our head down and just say yes constantly. Right. And whatever people want, we just, we agree to. And having to unlearn that is a really challenging process. It is. I would totally agree with that. So do you have roommates right now? Uh, no, it's just me. I uh, am very... Grateful to say that I just bought my first place. Hey, congratulations. So, um, I'm kind of just uh, decorating it right now and doing that. But yeah. I used to live with my best friend, uh, Sophie. Yeah, um, I've seen her, seen you guys in some interviews together. Yeah. You guys are awesome together. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, you got great chemistry. She's, uh, she's awesome, I love her. Yeah. And uh, so what would, what would some roommates say about you in, in ways that you, maybe you're tough to live with? Something they know oh, about you that the rest of the world doesn't know. You know what, know. I, so if you tell me to do something, I'll get it done. You're like, you, we need to mop, mop the floors, like, I'll knock it out. Okay. But you have to tell me to do it. Right. Otherwise, like, I, I'll like leave the floors unmopped for ages, or I'll do stuff where I, um, funny enough, my Sophie had to come up to me several times and going, there is a thing called a lint trap. You will burn down the apartment if you don't empty it. <laughs> I think that's in the dryer. I think that's where it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really funny. My wife and I are the same way. Cause like, I do whatever you tell me to do because that's not the point. Yeah. You need to realize. You, you know? have to be self-sufficient enough. Exactly. Uh, she's, I was like, I think that's good enough. She's like, it's not. It's yeah. not good enough. And I'm not your roommate. I'm your wife, yeah. so. Is there a vice that you feel kind of isn't a vice when people go, I don't know, people shouldn't be like this. You're like, I don't know, maybe that's not so bad. A, a vice, you said? Yeah, a vice. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, if somebody were to go ego, and you're like, well, I don't know, there's some positives to ego or oh, something like that. Oh, yes. Um, I think, I hope I'm answering this correctly, but anger uh, comes, sure. I think anger is such a healthy emotion, mm -hmm. but it just, it doesn't give it uh it doesn't get enough credit i can i think it can be a really healthy coping mechanism if you use it the right way i think it's not used correctly most of the time and then it leads to it getting a bad rap and mm -hmm. then people are like no anger is horrible we should not explore that emotion whatsoever <laughs> i think it's i it's funny you say that Karen, because actually it's the funniest emotion <laughs> it's uh, the funniest like, emotion favorite you well i don't think people who've been around me when i'm angry would agree with that but <laughs> I, uh, I do have a temper, and people when they meet me are like, no way, you don't really seem like you would. But other people pick up on it, they're like, yeah, I can see there's something brewing under there. I I'm, I'm the same way. I, I, I like to, I like to keep the thing of, I, I'm a, I like to believe I'm a level-headed person, and it takes a lot to piss me off, mm -hmm. but don't piss me off. <laughs> yeah, right. you're like the Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, like, you and I are really short people, you know, and so. Wait, what? I'm sorry to break it to you. I'm sorry to break it to you. And but so when I when people like us get mad, 
I'm, sometimes I'm not taken seriously. Like, oh, yeah. that's so cute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel like our, uh, if we were taller, I think our anger would be a bit more intimidating. But yes. if anything, it's like, oh, they thought they could do something with yeah, that. Yeah, I know. So I was like, I don't really have a temper. I have a tantrum. I just have <laughs> tantrums. And people are like, that's insane. But what are healthy ways to express it? Uh, a punching bag. And then okay. <laughs> sure. I sure. think that's... What that's, you would have been in high school. Is yeah, what said, I, yeah, I think just as important as it is to get angry, it's important to understand how to let go of anger. Mm. And I think that's what I'm really bad at. I think I, I can get angry and it's hard to uh, have me let go of that. And I, I think you need to find resolution after anger. And that's, uh, that's what, the only way that I can, it can be healthy. Is it's, yeah, it's a symbiotic, it. yeah, it's a symbiotic relationship with, um, yeah. With the truth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's really what it is. You no, know, no, I agree with you. What pisses you off though? What, what makes you angry? Uh, incompetence. <laughs> really? Like when somebody just doesn't do their job? Or? Yeah, I'm like really, I, 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 I grew up in my parents' small businesses. So I have a very like low bar and uh, for, I don't know, empathy when it comes to the workspace. I'm like, you get paid to do something, please do it well. Right. Um, but I, I'm trying to be more understanding of like, well, people carry their lives into their work. Like oh. you can't just, like not everyone is built like immigrants where they can just section off their lives and compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. It. Yeah, everything. Um, but that's important, right? Like I remember thinking about that way back, maybe even in high school, maybe when I was your age. <laughs> and it was just the idea of going, I think the, the most intellectually capable people are people who remove those dividers between bins. Like whatever you learn in, in physics, you could s somehow apply that to English, yeah. or, right? But then the most emotionally, the people with the EQ, they were able to erect these barriers. They were able to go, okay, I'm gonna keep that over there. Yeah. I'm really upset about this girl right now, but I still have to take this test. Yeah, and absolutely. Some people never learn that. I, I think there's, there's so much we go through in life that we forget is, is like our, our problems are more similar than we think they are most of the time is what I'm trying to say. What you're having trouble in your work and your love life, right? they could have the same problem and the same solution and you don't even realize it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. What would it mean to pull a you? Someone's like, man, he just pulled a Karin. What would that be? Oh my God. Uh, pulling a Karin means uh, forgetting every interaction that you've ever had. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad we're taping this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's good. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a horrible memory. So my, like, my friends will literally be like, you've, you've met this person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you know this person. You've met several times. <laughs> uh, so that would probably be the, the closest to pulling a Karin is, is forgetting. Anyone and anything. <laughs> I, I have an awful social memory as well. Yeah. And but you're good at memorizing lines, right? Uh, it, it, weirdly, it's it got bad there for a second, um, but it's it's coming back now. <laughs> what what drove it to become bad, and then what drove it to become good again? Uh, you know what? My depression got really bad, and so my memory uh, just tanked. Um, so I was like, for like forgetting interactions I was having moments ago. I was forgetting things I was saying moments wow. ago. Um, and uh, thankfully I got like, I got help and I was like getting yeah. a lot better, but it made, I, I had to like, uh, it lined up with the time of like losing Cameron, but I took time away from the industry because I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to memorize like one page of lines at this point right. <laughs> because I'm forgetting everything. Yeah. Um, but now it's gotten a lot better where I'm like, okay, Give me eight pages of sides and I'll be good. <laughs> like wow. I can handle it. That's impressive. And you could do that like overnight. Uh, yeah. overnight? That's hard. To, that's uh, maybe give me a day. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's still that's, yeah. That's a thing. What's a uh, a non-sexual thing you're into that would surprise us? Ooh, Legos. Oh, okay. I that's feel very like non sexual. As, I, uh, yeah, as well. Like, they fit together. So maybe yeah. That's, okay. <laughs> that's fair. Um, I it, recently, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I was like, I'm going to have a date night with myself. I'm going to like 
just gets go to Target, pick up some Legos, and I was like, I am really into this. Yeah. <laughs> I really like this. And it was a it was a stellar time. Did you have a great time? I think I'd take myself out again. That's good. Yeah, so <laughs> I'd say it's good. <laughs> You needed to let go. Yeah, exactly. Would you rather eat ice cream that tastes like poop or poop that tastes like ice cream? Ooh. That's the right answer, ooh, I think. Uh, yeah, it's so appetizing. I, I think I could never recover from the taste if it, was, if it tasted like shit. Yeah. So I think I would have to do the poo that tasted like ice cream. Yeah, even though knowing that you ate shit. Oh, yeah, that's just gonna, that would make me vomit just at the thought of that. Just the thought of it. But oh. at least you didn't, I guess. Would people know I did it? No. That's a great question. This is like eating alone in a restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a tree. This is you playing Legos by yourself yes. on that night. Because I'm a grown adult. <laughs> yes. a, a genie appeared and gave you this choice. Yeah. No one would ever know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it would, it would have to be the shit that, that tastes like okay, ice cream. No one would ever know. No. Except for this interview that exists. Really appreciate that and any advice to the kids out there? Uh, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be so fine. I love that. I love that. That's very to the point. Karin Brar, this is so fun. Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast. It was really, really great to meet you. You're very personal, very easy to talk to. So thanks everybody for joining us on what do you bring to the table? I've been your host, Rajiv, and I still am.